variable to our conversation. And uh, my task is just to identify who's the next person to speak or to ask a question. So uh, after Vien says a prayer and welcomes the Cardinal, I'll kind of, I'll kind of get us started on, on that. And we'll, ask the, we'll ask you, Cardinal, we're welcome and we're under you're here. We'll ask you to say a few words to kind of get us going, okay? So uh, <laughs> you can still be here to do that. So we're still too. Vien, would you leave us a prayer there, please? Everybody stay seated. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Colonel Tuxon, for agreeing to spend this evening with us. Um, last time I met you was in Rome in uh, January uh, or February 2022, and I really like what you shared with us at that general conference. And, and this led to this, uh, the invitation to the day home lecture and also to this evening. Um, now, as Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences and as the, the perfect uh, emeritus of the Dicastery for Promoting uh, Integral Human Development, uh, I guess you have a lot of access uh, to, to, to the Vatican and you're aware of what's going on on social issues that the church is, ta ta is facing and, and tackling. And so I hope that you can share with us to see some of the, the social issues that we're facing and, and, and social, issues, uh, social justice is something that, that is dear to, to us, the priests of the Sacred Heart. And by the way, the U.S. province will be celebrating our centennial uh, next year. So please keep okay. us in your prayers. Um, uh, so um, uh, Brother Duane will, will say... Um, uh, will lead the opening prayer, and Father Richard McDonald is our, our facilitator. He is the former provincial of the U.S. province. So, Brother Dwayne, please. Let us pray. Lord, God of peace, we praise you and we thank you for sending us Jesus, your beloved Son. Through the Paschal Mystery, you have made him the architect of all salvation, the source of all peace, the bond of all fraternity. We thank you for the desires, efforts, and accomplishments which your spirit of peace has effected in our day. To replace rancor with love, distrust with understanding, <coughs> and indifference with solidarity. Open our minds and hearts even more to the concrete requirements of the love of our brothers and sisters so that we may be ever better workers for peace. Remember, Father of mercy, all who are laboring, suffering, and dying to create a more fraternal world. May your reign of justice, peace, and love come for all people of every race and tongue. And may the earth be filled with your glory. Mm. Amen. 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 <coughs> well, first of all, Cardinal Tixon, we, we're honored to have you with us. We welcome you. And I'm assuming you know a little bit about the Priests of the Sacred Heart, but we as a religious community are professed to work for justice and peace. And what our ministry is here in, in the United States and in Canada, we work with the Native American people, with the uh, Blacks and the Hispanics in Texas and Mississippi, and we work with the Vietnamese people, and we're all professed to try to work for more just laws in our country. <coughs> And so we've, we've gathered, we've joined together with the Canadian SCJs to uh, be aware of the immigrants of the world, especially the migrants that come here to North America, and uh, always kind of conscious for any opportunity to change unjust laws. So having you present with us to speak to us and raise some more consciousness of justice and peace issues is an honor. We're grateful for that. And uh, we'd like to invite you to make some comments to us, and we're going to carry on a rather informal conversation with you. I'm sure some people have some <coughs> questions. And what I'm going to do is kind of identify you as you kind of give me a wave.
so that I can make sure that we don't overlook anybody that wants to speak with the cardinal to ask a question or to make some comments. So uh, I'm going to kind of call on the, the next one to speak and so forth after the cardinal said uh, some words to us. So thank you again for being with us and we welcome your words. Oh. <coughs> I think everybody, everybody is spoken without a microphone, so I can also try without a microphone, right? <laughs> unless, unless, unless somebody thinks it's not, it's not loud enough, then they will probably try to do with a microphone or something. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, uh, so thank, th th thank you all for, for tonight. Thank you for inviting me to prayer with you, the adoration of the Eucharist, and, and then to table. So fellowship before the Lord and fellowship at table. For both of them, I'm grateful. Grateful also for the invitation to be here. Uh, <clears throat> I was telling for the master and I, I spent, I spent four years uh, uh, during my formation in Albany, New York, but never made it this far, <laughs> uh, you know, into, into, into the Midwest. I, 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 I was doing theology, so my uh, preparation for the priesthood was preceded by four years in Albany with the Conventual Franciscans. They had a seminary in Albany in a place called Rensselaer, just outside Albany. And uh, so the only, only, only time we came way, way you know, west was uh, to attend the ordination of another Ghanaian in Indianapolis. Uh, where we rented a car. I just got my license, so just ready to step on it. <laughs> and uh, I was looked out for the state police. But <laughs> in any case, so uh, being here in your midst, I, I, uh, after the first encounter, I, I, and I'm telling, I, I've told several of you that you have a house in Rome, Villa Aurelia, that, that I knew very well. Uh, before coming over here because, because of its location, uh, it was the venue for several meetings that we organized from our office. Several meetings, uh, you know, uh, places and all of that, and others who organized meetings then invited us to speak or, or share thoughts like that. So we knew that, but we knew the house, we knew the institution, but we didn't, we didn't, we couldn't put any faces to it until last February when uh, you had your chapter and, and I was invited to share a little bit on social justice with you. And uh, <clears throat> the thing I tried to do then was, it's all, I find it's always tricky to, to talk or to speak with religious. <laughs> uh, uh, tricky in the sense that they invite you to talk about something that describes their own lives. Inviting me to speak about Father Dehon and uh, and uh, social justice, I mean, his life is your life, a and you you know so much about him that to have him have somebody from the outside speak to you is having like bringing coal to Newcastle. <laughs> you know, so, but in any case, so that but that's when I made a you know personal experience with the order meeting those who belong to the order, and finding what SCJ also meant and all of that. So, uh, so very glad to be here. Yes, uh, I'm originally from Ghana, was born there and, and did my education, everything in Ghana, until the bishop sent us to Albany, two of us, to do theology with the Franciscans. Uh, and we were then deacons over there, and then you know decided to go back to Ghana to be ordained priests. So after after, so I'm just giving the short version of the story, right? <laughs> after 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 ordination, the Archbishop asked what we wanted to do. I, I had I had preferred to study science and mathematics and all, but the bishop was not in agreement. And the seminary professors agreed with the bishop, so I had no chance. <laughs> so so uh, thinking that I was making things difficult because we're in Albany, I said, if I cannot do science, then, uh, then I like to do scripture in Rome. And then to my surprise, the bishop said, fine. 
So that's how I started studying scripture also in Rome. Okay, I did a license and then went back, did a license, went home, taught for a while, and then went back uh, for, for the doctorate. At the end of the doctorate, just on the point of making my defense, I was named a bishop in Cape Coast. I tried to buy time, so I was named in October, and I thought if I stayed till May, I would have done the defense and everything. The head of the Propagation of Faith, the Castri, Cardinal Tomko, Propagation of Faith, didn't think it was a wise thing. So, so uh, he told me, you need to be in your diocese to celebrate you know, the, the Christmas with your bishop, with your priests. So I thought, okay, I'll go and then come back to do, but it was not the same. The mere mention, the mere, the mere fact that your name is out or published as a bishop elect changes everything for you. It's like I, you know, Prophet Jeremiah. Wherever you go, you, you hear hissing sounds behind you. It was that same, that same, that same. That same. So, so, so things, things change radically. Your, your life is no more the same. Still try to live through that, but in any case. So, so I was ordained bishop for Cape Coast. And since that was an archdiocese, automatically became archbishop. And, uh, and uh, in charge of uh, you know, a province with eight other dioceses and all of that. One of the bishops in the day was actually my seminary professor. He taught me in seminary, and now he was my suffragan. And, uh, and uh, we had to find a way of dealing with that. So I did that for how many years? 17 years or so. Then in 2003, uh, I was named a cardinal. We were the last group of John Paul II, 2003. It was a very big group. From over here in the United States, Cardinal Regali, if you know him. Regali was part of our group, and the rest were a lot of Italians and, you know, Croatia, Bozanish, Eldo from Hungary, uh, Barbara from France. Uh, so, group like that. And in those days, as you know, John Paul was already very frail and, you know, very sick. He's supposed to put a beret on your head, but you could hardly do it. So you just barely got a beretta, and you had to take it and then put it on your own head and all of it. So two years after that, he passed. So we consider ourselves the Benjamin of, uh, of uh, John Paul II. So after that, I went back to Ghana, business as usual, but wasn't as usual. <laughs> so they happened to be the first cardinal in Ghana. There's never, we've never had a cardinal in Ghana. So there was a lot of excitement and all of that. So after, after 70 years, Pope Benedict invited me to the Vatican to, uh, to take charge of the Council for Justice and Peace. And as you know, that council is actually a council for social issues that the Vatican has to deal with. Name Justice and Peace comes from Popularum Progressio of, John, of Paul VI, where justice was just what the name he applied to all you know, social issues. So, we did that for seven years, and, and, and Pope Francis decided to merge four, of, four such dicasteries into one, creating the present dicastery for promoting integral human development. So justice and peace, migrants, health care, and cor unum. Cor unum was actually in charge for humanitarian assistance. So they were put together to become the council uh, the Council for Promoting Integral Human Development did that for four years, and uh, five years that ended last December. And in January, Pope Francis asked me to go to the academies of science and uh, social sciences, and and that's uh, that's uh, that's where we are now. Uh, only thing is that the change is not it's 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 not it's not terribly great. Or, you know, great in the sense that there's not a big change of material. Because a lot of the issues that the Dicastri deals with, the academy also deals handles on a more academic level, but same issues. Ecology, you know, healthcare, research, and all of that. So, so that's, uh, that's what we've been doing since the, since the 6th, of Gen uh, 6th of June this year. Uh, and the uh, only, only, only big thing about it is that 
we make it a point to tell anyone who visits the academy of the fact that the, the Catholic Church is the only religion that has had an academy of science right from the, not from the beginning, the church goes way back, but you know, the only, 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 only religious group you know, that, that's had an academy of science for so long. 1601 was the academy of sciences. And so from 1601 to now, we've had the Academy of the Sciences. And uh, Galileo was a member before he had the sun and the moon going around the earth. And so, and so but that was settled later on by John Paul II. And, uh, and uh, a, few, a few other prominent people. Right now, the Academy of the Science has six Nobel Prize winners who are members. And, uh, and the point we make is that for the Catholic Church, having maintained an academy of the sciences for so long just yes, means that it does not see any conflict between faith and science. Okay, for the Catholic Church, there is no tension between faith and science. You know, it's all searching for the two, two different methodologies, but, you know, uh, uh, seeking and spread after the same truth. So, so that's, what, that's what we're doing uh, till now. Uh, academy of Science was two since 1601. And then uh, with John Paul II, a decision was made to add another academy, this time of the social sciences. So that has been added to it. They all operate from the same office and building, but the Academy of Science and the Academy of Social Sciences, so the two are what we deal with uh, to today. So this is my story. <laughs> As I was uh, looking up your background before you, <laughs> before you got here, uh, I mean, we were talking about as far back as late March and, and April. I was very impressed that um, there are a lot of videos. It seems like you're producing uh, videos from different meetings on different topics um, that are abounding with, within throughout the world. Um, and it, it seems like this is a, a new way of communicating and outreach uh, to the world. Is, is that something new that was just started? A lot of YouTube videos and that are, are coming out of you know, <laughs> you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not aware of it. <laughs> so uh, the, the, you know, the office, all the offices I've talked about have a communication unit. So probably they do this but they don't ask for my permission to do any, any of those things. The, the moment we have an event, and the event is public, you know, the decisions that I think can also you know, go public. So they may present a YouTuber for whatever type of thing, but uh, I'll be frank, I, I hardly go back to see you know, what has been done and all of that. I assume it's done in good faith, so, so I don't go to check anything, whether, you know, whatever type of thing. But, but to tag on to this was something very recent, very recent. Pope Francis uh, sent somebody to me uh, to, ask, to ask us in the academy to create a, a, a task force, uh, okay, to deal with defamation, wrong information, and things like that in the media. Okay, so it's a, we're trying to put together a team. If, if any of you is interested in working on the team, we'll be glad to have you on. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so the, 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 the task of the team will be able to, because defamation and wrong information, and wrong reporting is very much now that's in the media, and the church suffers quite a bit from that. So the idea is to be able to you know, look at that, see how we can counter those type of things. So that has to do with, you know, so the YouTubes and whatever type of thing, yes. Uh, with all the travels and all the conferences we do, uh, they present uh, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, our thing, our, our thing is probably to get the word out. I know that the challenge we face now in the academy, I've got a lot of people you know, say that the work of the academy is not publicized well enough. Okay, when the academy has an event with all the top scientists and everything, right after the event, a statement is made 
which goes on the website. And the statement is about, we met from such a day to such a day on such and such a topic, and that and that and that and that and that is what you know, we decided. If, if there was no unanimity on the subject, we'll say some majority of us thought this way, but there's another group or whatever type of, so that immediately will go on the website. Then the different inputs would be collected and then edited into a book. Okay, that would also be published. And then that's, that's, that's what people complain, you know, it doesn't go out. Okay, so uh, one of the things I plan to do is to see how we can get this online with Amazon or one, whatever type of thing to, to make it more accessible to people. Or whenever anything is published, we send complimentary copies to bishops' conferences. We cannot talk about houses of formation. We don't know how many exist in the world. If we decide to send a copy to seminaries or whatever, I don't know how much we'll be doing. But at least bishops' conferences we know. So it goes to the new CHS, bishops' conferences, and the amb ambassadors of uh, countries to the Vatican. Okay, so they, they are first outlets, and you know, we leave it at that and see what the rest will do. accepted here in the United States, Bishop. And I'm not sure what it's all about, but I wonder whether you could say more about this, about Pope Francis' influence on uh, social justice, uh, his uh, Laudato Si, Fratelli Tutti. He's giving a whole new went to the Catholic Church, I believe. And we have not yet fully appreciated the uh, implications of his approach. Mm. I wonder whether you, as, uh. as Cardinal of, and, and Gordon at the Vatican, as you so marvelously described. So, no, so that the Cardinal doesn't add anything to it. <laughs> 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 the kind of, <laughs> no, the, the, so it's, it's, it's this, uh, you know, in a way, in a way, uh, I had also had, a, had a, I also ha, I've had a question coming here, okay, because you talk so much about social justice, right. okay, and, 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 and somewhere at some whatever point, I would have put the question, okay, uh, whether you have any difficulty here in the United States using the word social and calling social justice. I know that as we travel here in the United States talking about the church's social thought or social doctrine, we've had a few challenges from people saying, so, people understand social as socialism. A lot of people, you mentioned the word social, they understand socialism. You mentioned common good, they're talking about communism. So uh, that, that kind of thing is there. And, 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 and it's, as if, it's as if anything that does not sound, that, that does not extol capitalism is considered to be a threat to the United States or the lifestyle or thing over here. But you know, that it's, not, it's, not, it's not true, it's not the case. Okay, because social is not socialism and common good is not communism. I don't know how, unless probably we change the English word social and call societal. I mean, if, 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 if Timothy, uh, if, if Timothy will say, not, uh, uh, not uh, what's his name, James. If James will say faith without works is dead, okay? And we'd have to identify the works. And you say the works is your involvement, like you know, on the home, involvement and engagement in society. And so you refer to the thing as social works that you perform. How can that social then be understood as socialism? 
unless there's an English adjective that we can use, you know, not to use social, but if we can find another expression that would talk, that would, that would, that, that, that would express the need for the faith we have to manifest itself in concrete gestures in the lives of people. So, so I, 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 I know that now. So they said now, for what Pope Francis uh, is said, I was in um, Fort Wayne at the beginning of the year uh, for, some, for some commencement address, and the bishop was there, and right after the ceremony, invited me to join him for a confirmation that he had in a parish nearby. So we went, so he did a confirmation, preached and spoke, but at the end of it, wondered whether there was something I could say, okay? So knowing just what you've said, that there's, you know, a lot of people are not happy with Pope Francis, I told them that in my life, I've known or I've had experience with three popes. Okay, so took the opportunity to talk about the three popes, but made a crucial point that the thing is not to see one pope in the light of the other. It will not, it will not be fair, it will not be just. Like when I, was, uh, when I was appointed bishop, my predecessor, the first archbishop, he had accompanied Ghana in its independence march, okay? And so the first question I got was, how do you hope to fit into his shoes? And my answer was, I would not even try. Those shoes may be big, but they may well be too small. So the thing for me is not to fit into anybody's shoes. You find your own shoes, and you wear your own shoes. You don't fit in anybody's shoes. So, so you know, talking about the three popes, I said, a lot of people have known John Paul II. He was made pope at 58. So had a, you know, a lot of times before. So, you know, a lot, a lot of our younger generation, the church have only known Pope, you know, John Paul II and all. So a very popular, charismatic one. But then Benedict came. In the days of when people used to travel, the audience hall was packed. People, people liked to listen to Benedict explain complicated theological issues in very simple, whatever type of thing. So Benedict had his own charism too. The teaching, whatever type of thing. Then came Pope Francis from, from the, if you want, from the third world, or certain part of the globe, Latin America, a pope of the Aparecida, a pope that was, uh, that, you know, that had, you know, very much his own style of uh, pastoral ministry with him, going to the peripheries, reaching out to the poor, whatever type of thing. So, and, and you know, each one, each of these three, has, uh, they, they all have their own styles and, and way of, uh, you know, leading the church. So, my, what I say is, we, priests of the Catholic Church. There's no priest who celebrates Mass without praying for the Pope. And therefore, if you count how many priests there are in the world, and if they are all to say Mass every day, then how many people are praying for the Pope every day? And how can so very many priests pray for a Pope and still have the Pope a child of a devil? Then it's, it's either our own prayers, there's a problem with our own prayers, or we're not praying to the true God or whatever. But it's not possible that every priest prays for the Pope, and then the Pope is not the Pope of God, you know, whatever. So, so there's, there's something that I, I find basically theologically questionable in all of this thing. If the Pope is not to your taste, then, then there are two things. You do not only check out the Pope, but check out your own selves. You know, uh, uh, no, so this will be, I'm so, uh, I don't want to be doing all the talking, otherwise there will be no questions. But, but, but is this that, is that, that, that thing, all I wanted to say is that sometimes also we're very comfortable. With, we have a culture that we call uh, diet coke, <laughs> <laughs> alcohol, alcohol-free beer, and all of that. So such cultures enable us to grab Christianity 
also in take out its challenging aspects. And we have diet Christianity, alcohol-free Christianity. We are Christians, but what challenges us in Christianity we can take out? Yes, we can take out anything that is strong of coke or beer or whatever type of thing and still have beer. So sometimes uh, Christianity becomes alcohol-free Christianity. And that just means that we, we, we ensure that the challenging things are set aside. So what is Pope Francis doing? If Pope Francis is calling us to a way of, of, living, of living like... Before benediction this morning, you said a very beautiful prayer that called for you know, uh, uh, you know, openness to the poor and all of whatever type of thing and all of that. So, so you know, all of this, all of this exists. Now, how, how, how do they take place unless people commit themselves to it? I was in, I was in Modesto. We organized a meeting there for popular movement for whatever. The farm owners didn't come, although the five bishops of the diocese were there. And they didn't come because they thought that we we're going to put them on the carpet. We we're going to, you know, we we're going to attack them. It wasn't to attack them. It was, simply, it was simply to draw attention to the plight of the farm workers. That's all. And unless it's, it's, unless it's, 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 it's sinful or un, un, unacceptable to draw attention to some, something that exists in your backyard. And there I was told the story of Cardinal Mahon. And, and told that since Mahon was so much an advocate of the migrants, people registered their protest by putting in black pieces of paper in the collection box. Okay, to simply say that we're not giving you our money because of your position, what you stand for. So, so, so uh, we can have all of those protests, but it's up to us to sometimes recognize what we stand for and what we know we live by. So the thing about Pope Francis, I do not quite understand. I find it unfortunate that you know, uh, you know, his position is challenging, and if a position is challenging, if anything at all is challenging for us in life, it just means that there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with him. And I don't look for what is wrong only in him, but I'm also invited to look at what is wrong in me. So that has to happen. It's, it's a mutual two-way type of thing that has to happen. But uh, certainly his, his style of leadership is not the same. Dioceses which are traditional, normally will have a bishop who will be automatically cardinal. You can imagine how Milan can be without a, without a cardinal. But Milan now is without a cardinal. You can imagine how Venice will be without a cardinal, but Venice is without a cardinal. And rather, Samoa, Central African Republic, or these outlying places where God, not God for a second, nobody knows where, they have cardinals. <laughs> So, so he's probably trying to say that the church is not just here. The church is also all of these. So let's give recognition also to them. Now, is that a bad thing to do? So, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation to sometime, you know, uh, also recalibrate a little bit our own thoughts on whatever type of thing. But the challenge is, is, is a thing that is there. And uh, I know, I know the, the challenge is for all of us. If I may give a, 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 a laughable example, not to be recorded. <laughs> when I was made a cardinal and I came to Rome, I had priests that I had ordained who were working in New York. So I said, look, I'm in, in, in Rome now. Can you find a, a, a decent car that I can, whatever? And they brought me a Lexus. <laughs> okay, 350. And so... In those days, with with the Benedict, and I didn't make a you know, my break. Everybody now, SCV one, which is the car number one of that was used by the Pope, was a Mercedes Benz. SCV two, Mercedes Benz, whatever, Secretary of State, and a lot of cardinals had all kinds of whatever. So using a Lexus didn't. It was big, but it didn't cause whatever problem. So Francis came, and Francis parked all the uh, 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 whatever Benz, and he was using a Ford Focus. <laughs> And so everybody started migrating <laughs> from, from Christ to whatever. And at a certain point, 
the Lexus 350 became too big. Also to use in Rome in those, under those conditions. So I had to also give it up. You know, it also went away. And, and you know smart? Smart. Smart, smart, smart. car. Smart. Yeah, very easy to park in Italy. So that's what I use now. <laughs> I can't give anybody a ride. It's just uh, so. I mean, so that you, there's something that you can actually call Pope Francis effect. You can describe a Pope Francis effect in several ways on the church, on the episcopacy, cardinal nomination. And, oh, you can you can always say you know describe whatever that. So he certainly represents a change of mind, a change of perspective. Okay, it's not that it's terribly critical, but, but you know, he talks about the economy, that the present economy is an economy that kills. It's true, Obama quoted that, but, but a lot of people are not comfortable with it. But the point is also true. If, 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 somebody, if a poor man dies on the street, you know, from exposure to cold, whatever type of thing, he makes no headlines. But the stock exchange falls by a point or two, it makes the headlines. So what is more important, the rise in stock exchange or fall or the man who has died? So those type of things he will talk about. And, and that may be uncomfortable to people, but, you know, so sometimes it's true to see what one is, one, one, one is not used to seeing or used to hearing, that's all. <laughs> Someone else like to make a comment, make a, ask a question? Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Um, in your point of view, um, what are the challenges or differences or similarities uh, on social justice from Ghana to Rome to Brooklyn, New York that you <laughs> experience? Uh, it would be interesting for me to hear that you touch a little bit about the same term, difference meaning. Uh, can you share a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, okay, so, yes, uh, so, so basically, this is a little bit, uh, probably, a little bit what, what we'll probably talk about tomorrow. But initially, the thing about social justice issues in days of Father De Hoon, et etc., et cetera, used to be addressing concrete whatever. As time went on, the, the, uh, the understanding is kind of evolved a little bit. And it's like, at the bottom of all of this, in the midst of all of this, you're actually talking about a human person. So there's, there's, a, there's an interest, a shift from social question to anthropological question. What is the human person? Okay, and its well-being and development has become a central issue. In that sense, the challenges are in Ghana, as there are in everywhere, Europe, whatever, whatever, whatever. Does a human person live always in a condition that ensures their full dignity and full whatever, 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 in every sense? Not always, you cannot always have it all. Once in Rome, we did, a, we did, a, we did an event, organized event on impact investing. Okay, the economic issue, okay, and impact investing. Uh, it was something that I had done once myself in Ghana as a bishop. I did not believe that the thing to, for a local bishop, and there are several of us in Africa, India, Latin America, you cannot finance very serious projects with donations and grants. Living here, you probably have the, you've made the experience or know that some bishops from Africa, Asia, India, they make contact with the bishop here in America and come over to preach at masses. And at the, at the end of the mass, the collection is taken and then, and then is given to him. You, if you're lucky, you get 20,000 or whatever. And I ask the question, what is 20,000 for a project of building a hospital? Nothing. Okay, so, so, so I started saying to myself, therefore, we need to migrate from this model. We cannot run a mission on grants and donations. 
we need to find more sustainable models, if even it become business models. And that's why I started thinking about impact investing. There are groups, a mixture of philanthropy and venture capital, which can, which can you know, uh, grant you money, loan, sometimes without interest or lower the interest because of the impact that the project would make, okay? And consider the impact as interest and so reduce whatever type of term. You'd have to pay the money back, but you can, you can realize what you want to realize with whatever thing you ask for. I did that in Ghana, and I built three hostels for a university near in Cape Coast for students, accommodation, and a source of income also for the diocese. Okay, so stuff, 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 stuff like that. Therefore, uh, I, think, I, 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 think, I think that uh, there is the need to, to, to consider uh, you know, a whole lot of the few things. And in that sense, this challenge is not only in Ghana, it's in all mission countries. In fact, there's a small document we're working on from our office, which will bear the title, Financing Church Mission. It's a very basic thing. The church has a mission, but that mission requires financing. How do we do it? The Vatican has that challenge. Dioceses have that challenge. Parishes have that challenge. Congregations will have the same challenge. Whenever you have a mission, you need to find a way of financing the mission. We told in the gospel that Jesus was followed by women, rich women, who supported his ministry from their means. Financing church mission, okay? So Jesus had a, had, a, had, a, had, a, had a way of financing, you know, so, so that issue is there. And therefore, and therefore uh, certain situations then, then lend themselves to this. Therefore, the challenge about what I've discovered to be, you know, challenges out there, that situation is there for, for, for Ghana. Unfortunately, we have challenge from government spending, corruption, whatever, that is there. We try to fight against talk about all of that. It's, it's still there. Uh, social justice issues. You have, you, have, you have a couple. Biggest challenge for me now is elections and what we call democracy or democratic regimes. I'm not opposed to democracy. I'm for democracy. But the democracy as we, democracy as we practice it in Ghana and several other countries of party election for four years, and then a new one comes, whatever. It's got a lot of challenges and problems for us. One, the parliamentarians or the ministers, okay, who need to be elected. Election is no more people choosing somebody whom they consider worthy to represent their interests in parliament, but somebody who gives money to be voted for. And once you give money to be voted for, you bought, okay, your election to parliament. So once over there, you make out, you make back the money you spend to get elected. And so being in parliament or whatever is not actually to take care of your constituency and their needs and all of that, is to make back the money you spend to get elected. It happens with presidents, it happens with ministers, and that does not advance for me, that's not. It does not advance democracy. And so what we have is that every, every, every government that is elected, first thing it complains about is empty coffers. Okay, the coffers of the state, empty. Who emptied it? The one leaving. And so they struggle to get whatever, another one to be emptied again. So, I mean, if this is what democratic governance is, then we need to look for something else. Okay, I'm not, I'm not asking for dictators either, okay, but either, either we clean up this system and make the so-called servant leadership begin to really work for some people, or, or we need to lose. So the challenges are like that. In, for, in the so very many developing countries uh, in force to do democracy and all of that, is democracy with a lot of these challenges. So that's, 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 that's one, you know, a big case for us. We are trying to be sensitive to time because 
Carmen wants to have a little bit of time tonight to look over that big talk he's going to give us tomorrow, which we're looking forward to very much, your Jehonian lecture. No. But, uh, anyway, we're uh, looking for anybody else. No, sure. Anybody have a question? Uh, sure. Yes. <coughs> Uh -huh. I'm an undergrad student in the, in the formation program, so unfortunately I won't sure, no be able to be at the school. But, um, and you kind of touched on this in your introduction, talking about faith and reason and uh, the fruitful tension that we've always believed has persisted in the church. Um, I have the privilege of taking an existentialism course uh -huh. uh, this year, so talking about the death of God has been the theme of that course. And I'm kind of curious to hear your perspective here in the West especially, and in European and American societies, we kind of see this mass embracement of the death of God and this rejection of traditional Christian spirituality. So I'm curious, from your perspective um, and the situations you've worked in, how do we persist in our mission of social justice in a society and culture that's now beginning to reject the church as an enemy of social justice? The church as an enemy of social justice. <clears throat> okay, so you're taking a course in existentialism, you're talking about God and, and all of that, <clears throat> death of God and all of that. So, uh, so tomorrow, yes, tomorrow I'll mention Nietzsche. Okay? <laughs> no, but think about it. Nietzsche is a contemporary of the home. Yes. You know, several of these big names that Nietzsche, Marx, Freud, they're all contemporaries of the home. Okay, so tomorrow that's one thing I'll mention. So I say, you know, so we're looking at the home and uh, you know, whatever type of thing. And the tough time he had, because at one point he talks about the poor workers losing faith and trust in God, yeah. because they were not only listening to the home, there were other voices in society which they were listening to. And those included the voice of Karl Marx, Freud, Emil Durkheim, Max Weber, all of these, they were contemporaries, okay? Of so, so their voices, it's, it's the same thing now. You know, it's not only the voice of the church, which is ringing out there in society. There are several other, other voices, challenging sometimes with big money behind it also. And, and, and also, we need to reckon with that. So uh, the thing about the church and, you know, social justice and all, is very basic. The basic, the basic thing about it is that uh, if, we, if we start off with the with a, with a, with a observation or recognition that every human person is a relational being, okay? Every, every human person is a relational being by nature. It's a person, but a relational being, okay, if even an individual. And the rela relationality of the person, relational being with God, with one another, and with creation, okay? And if, if that is the case, then the first thing I would say is that the first meaning of justice is respect for the demands of a relationship in which you live in. That is the first sense of justice. When you respect the demands of the relationship in which you live in, that's your justice. The biblical expression tzedakah and tzedek and all of those things Express that, okay, the just man. So in the Bible, what you have is the just and the unjust. These are the primary categories of sin and righteousness in the Bible. And so the just man is the one who respects the demands of the relation in which we, we, you know, he lives. And the first demand, our relationship with God. To respect that relationship, so, so worship of God, it's, it's not a luxury. It's just, it's just, it's just what... If we understand, that's why I'm saying that the question moves from social to anthropological. Okay. It's, now, it's not a time to understand the human person to understand what it means to be a man. <laughs> what it means to be, uh, what's it? I don't want to say man. Uh, so what it means to be a human? <laughs> what, it means, what it means to be a human, you know, a human being, right? So the sense of man is very crucial. They are very crucial because if we understand ourselves as relational beings, then relationship with God is, is, is part of our being. And how do we respect that demand? 
So cult of worship is an act of justice. Okay, and when we transgress, when we did abuse or whatever that justice, it plays out on the other justices. So the other treatment or the regard of race with others with whom we live and then ultimately with nature. This big you know, ecological question or crisis that we're talking about now, ecological this, ecological that, injustice. The same disregard of relations if it plays out between us and God, sooner or later it plays out in everything else. So it's, it's, it's as basic as that. And, and when, when righteousness is settled straight with God, then it plays out so, so. So there with God, we'll talk about holiness. And therefore, allow that to see, talks also about this. Ecological conversion that should lead to holiness, and that also means that our relationship with one another and with creation also become wholesome. So, so that's, uh, that's what it is. So what you start with uh, existentially plays out into all of these. Very, very basic sense and all derives on you know, understanding a human person as a relational being. Thank you. Hmm. He just wrote your paper for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thankfully, I don't have to write a paper for this oh, course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can meet me there tomorrow. <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. You probably should skip class tomorrow. Maybe I'll put that in your lecture. Well, I, don't, I don't have existentialism tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, we're, yeah. we're just about out of time, but Frank, you go ahead. Maybe I'd like to get down a little more, um, I hate to say the word practical, but for those that are working with the poor, working with justice issues, da 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 da, da do you have any wisdom for, um, I remember hearing a Latin American bishop one time, it was a very helpful quote for me. The poor are not always fun to work with. Or no. Easy to work with. No. And so people that are, you know, facing, they're, they're really knocking themselves out to help the poor, and the poor don't, don't want it, or they won't respond, or they won't cooperate, or they're screwing the system, and all this kind of stuff. Any word for those that are caught in that kind of a jungle? <laughs> it's a good question. Caught in that. It is, uh, <clears throat> so I start, I mentioned a short while ago that I did my theology in Albany. When I was a deacon, I was supposed to work in an inner city parish. Uh, in Albany, there's this parish in a part of Albany called Arbor Hill. Uh, from, from what you see there, beautiful St. Joseph's chair with a beautiful pipe organ, Used to be a neighborhood with the Dutch and the Irish in the past, and now you know become an inner city neighborhood uh, with the, you know poor communities and all. And at one point, as a deacon, my 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 ministry or part of my job was to was to go uh, from house to house and tell people about the Catholic Church. Okay, so I went ringing doorbells to tell people about the church and all. In a few places, they sat me down and lectured me. <laughs> so, you know, so, but that, 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 that was it. Uh, dealing, de de dealing with the poor is always uh, an interesting b business. One, because uh, going out to them, one has to have it clear in his own head. If, if, if you're reaching out to them because He's saying because they're poor, that's why you're coming to them. That's already probably a mistake. To, to, to give them a sense of being poor, that's why you're coming to them. That probably is a non-starter. Uh, probably not to start with that. That appears to be condescending. That appears to be whatever, whatever. So uh, if, if one can have an, uh, another way, a way of initiating that contact and communication, Apart from the thing of being poor or non poor, that would be that would be that would be that would be preferable. That would be that would be that would be that would be, be more useful. So what is it? So it's just like saying that people are poor, but they want they don't want to be told they're poor. Uh, uh, people live in whatever type of thing, but they don't you know they don't want to be told that they need help and whatever type of thing. So so the thing is probably to find a a, a, 
a tangential way of approaching the issue, probably not held on and whatever type of thing. So if, if it was possible for one to establish some other relationship, and out of that relationship gradually get into the heart of it, which is you know, the poverty, that, that probably is the thing. But a whole, unfortunately, a whole lot of organization, whether on the level of the United Nations or whatever, or uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 faith-based organizations or whatever type of thing, it always goes out with that kind of thing. We're coming to help you. And, and that's why people sometimes say, to help me. Who says I need help in the first place? No. So, so, that, so sometimes it's approach and methodology. That, that, that sometimes does, does that thing. And uh, if, if once we simply go approach whatever and share their life without anything, and then from sharing their life, begin to show options. Oh, you do it this way, but let's try this one. You do it this way, but let's try this option. So gradually get them from within to you know, uh, recognize the possibilities or changes or whatever how you know, the way new things can be done, that becomes a very gradual, a little bit tedious, but that becomes a gradual way of doing without any resistance, as it were. Because the, the worst thing that can happen doing with some of these is that people close in, you know, close up on themselves, and then, then you cannot get through anymore. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know whether that's a word of wisdom, but uh, the, the, the interesting thing, when I got to Rome in 2010, there's an Italian group called the Communion e Liberazione. Communion e Liberazione. They organized an event about, about poverty. And uh, so they invited me. I don't know what they were expecting me to say. So when I got there and I, I talked about <clears throat> the fact that I came from a family of 10. And started talking about my uh, life, all of us went to school and all of that. And, uh, we got a new dress uh, twice a year at Christmas and Easter. That's when we got a new dress. And, and uh, until, until, uh, until I started going to secondary school, I didn't, I didn't wear shoes and whatever type of and, and, and then I did that, but I didn't. So you know, my uh, 10 of us, like uh, kids, we didn't feel we were poor. And, and People did not understand that, okay? At the meeting, what? You, you got a dress twice a year, and you didn't feel you were poor. So we ate three times a day. Uh, whenever there was a feast, we could celebrate it, and all of that. Just that we didn't have dress any time. Three times, twice a year, we got a new dress. Christmas and Easter to celebrate, uh, probably because we were Christians, I don't know. But that's when we got two new dresses, Christmas and Easter, new dress for the feast coming up and all of that. My elder brother, who went to secondary school before me, on, on going to secondary school, you know, was prescribed, so he got his first shoes to, to, to wear. Otherwise, we, 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 we went by a local uh, footwear, which we have chalewote. It's almost like a sandal, but all, it's, all, it's all plastic and rubber, okay, not for proper shoes. But that's also, if you wanted something under your feet, you got that. You could, you could use that and wear that. But proper should I say, you know, when I was going to second school, that was a thing. So, you know, so by standards to the group I was speaking, that amounted to something like poverty. Because it didn't have what you, I don't know, whether it's what you wanted or whatever type of thing. So again, so what is poverty and what is poor and what is whatever? That's sometimes a question of perspective, you know, and, uh, but, so that's, that's, that's the tricky thing about, if, if one were to go, on, go out to a community, let's say from here, uh, and, and with everything that is available, you go and expect that those things will be available there, that would be a mistake. Okay, so probably you take them from where they are, and gradually, you know, uh, uh, you know, build them up or whatever type of thing. And uh, yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a, and our family wasn't terribly. My father was a carpenter in a mining town. <clears throat> my mother, she sold vegetables on the market, tomatoes, whatever. And with that, they took care of ten children. 
So a few, a few months back, Mario Draghi, the president of Italy, joined the Academy for an event on the family. And, and the discuss, concluding discussion became the autonomous Malthusian about poverty and population growth. And then he was coming out of that, I said, Mr. Prime Minister, I have an example to give. I said, I come from a family of 10. My father was a carpenter, my mother was whatever. And, and they took care of 10 children. We all went to school, university, secondary school, and all of that. Nobody was left behind, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, I, I don't think it's what you say. The one thing that is missing from your explanation is sacrifice. I say, if parents accept to make sacrifices, they can do anything they want to do. But if parents are not making so how can a carpenter and a, you know, a trader and vegetable take care of 10 kids, send each of them to secondary school and all of that to universities? There's got to be a lot of sacrifice. So I said, that's what is missing in your, in your discourse. And yeah, see, see, see my. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so very much. Our province has a friend, a lady named Sister Norma Pimentel, who works on the Texas-Mexico border. Okay. And she does many, many things for the immigrants coming from Latin America. And when they asked her, what does she do? She says, I work at restoring human dignity. Oh. She doesn't say, I help the poor. She says, I work on restoring human dignity. And we just love her for the spirit that she brings to our mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. So we're mm -hmm. very grateful, and thank you all for being present. Uh, Deanna, I want to invite you to kind of bring this to a close. You don't have to summarize everything. <laughs> 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 and, a, and a closing prayer. So okay. thank you, Carlo, for, for, for your time with us. I, I know that it's almost 3 a.m. in Rome, so you must, you must be very sleepy with the time change and jet lag. And I'd be grateful for what you share with us, the insights, your insights on social connection with the uh, with our Dehonian spirituality and also social justice as well. And so thank you very much for being with us. Uh, would you mm. uh, uh, would you please give us a, a blessing or a closing uh, a prayer before we end the night? That's a way of ending my dinner, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. So I hope it's in the name of the Lord who made them and that. Mighty God, just want to thank you for the gift of vocation, beginning with that of Father Dehong and all of his children that you've got in this place and several other places around the world. We thank you for the gift of your vocations, the way you support and you sustain and nourish all of that to this point. So for our conversation tonight, Father, you've been private to it, and we just want to ask you to, to bless us all, bless those who serve in the ministries and now are in retirement in this home, bless their rest, bless their old, rage, old age, and those who are also now witnessing and living this faith, we ask you, Lord, to lay your hand on them, bless, nourish them, and support your understanding, and at the end of the day, we commend them and all their benefactors and all to you and ask you to bless them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace. We will do. Okay. All right. So now that I've earned my dinner. <laughs>